Okay. I'm very happy to be here and to see so many people to listen to my, my lectures. So um, I divided into two pieces. The first part will be about structured illumination microscopy, which is one uh, method for, let's say, medium super resolution. It gives you only a factor of two, as you will see. Um, and the second talk will be on light sheet microscopy, which is a, a method that allows you to um, get optical sectioning and, uh, of relatively large specimens. You see that that guy is done with light sheet microscopy. It is a fly. Um, right. Can I maybe first get a, a show of hands of, about your background? Because I'm not 100% sure. So who of you studied physics? That's a fair bit. Uh, who of you studied biology? A few. Some did both. <laughs> um, right. And is theoretical physics background? Very few. OK. Who has heard about Fourier transforms before? Most. Good. OK. Then, then I'm reasonably safe to use. To, I don't need to spend lots of time to explain what a spatial frequency is and, and stuff like that. Good. So uh, let's jump right into it. Um, to motivate my talk, um, I want to start with this statement uh, that says this is the classical way of how, how to think about optics. People have some optics, and, and they have an object, and they look with the optics at the object, and they get the image either directly on the retina or maybe on a camera or maybe on a TV screen in the confocal scanner or something like this. But um, I want to challenge that by saying, well, maybe that's not the best way to get get your information. There's plenty of other ways. And why don't we do it like this? You have an object, optics, you get some data, and then you crank the data through a computer and you get your image, and then you've also measured something. So um, there's, of course, a lots of pros and cons for both ways of viewing things. But just as an example, I want to show you some, some methods in medical imaging that are state-of-the-art imaging methods um, that all are heavily based on the use of computers. So if I gave you the raw data of any of these methods, you wouldn't be able to tell anything from it without the help of a computer and heavy data processing to get the results in the end. So in microscopy, that's not so typical. But SIM, structured elimination, is one method where you actually do need a little bit of computer um, to interpret your images and get your high resolution image. So what is it all about? And I have a, a little demo here. So um, did you have a lecture on, on what Abe's resolution limit is already? Yeah, you, you had even the Abe diffraction experiments, which is a fantastic introduction to it. So, so that means you are aware that if you have a very low numerical aperture, you're going to not have a good resolution. And so if somebody sits in the back there, even they have good quality eyes, they might not be able to see what's on here. And to you, it might look like an equally gray screen because the upper resolution limit of your eye is terribly low because you're sitting so far away. And then the, the angle of acceptance to this slide is very low. So, and what I did is I printed very high frequency information on that slide. So it's a super high frequency, spatial frequency information. You can't resolve it because it's below upper limit. So now the trick in structured illumination is to say, I have another thing that you can probably also not see because it's another very high frequency pattern. In this case, it's not, this was a, it's a pretty irregular pattern. This one is very regular. It's just straight lines, but beyond Abe if you want, yeah, or just at the Abe limit or so. And now I'm going to put the two together, and then you get something that's called a Moiré effect. So if I do this, then suddenly you can see some, some, Black? Oh. Maybe I, I have to stand. Does it work better when you have the white screen? So once again, this is the one high resolution, the other one, and I put them together, and then it should not be black. It should be, yeah? Do you see it now? So um, the main point is, of course, this looks like a pretty image of, of who is it? Ernst Abbe, exactly. So, so that's Ernst Abbe. But uh, the, the main point here is that it contains Lots of low frequency stuff. You see large areas that are white and black. And so that's why you can resolve them even at a big distance. So that means we are somehow able to transport high frequency information by multiplying them with another high frequency information pattern into a low frequency information. And that low frequency information can pass through a microscopic system. And then we can reconstruct. But 
So I was cheating a little bit. Why was I cheating? Because this is, of course, not what you're interested in, this beautiful image. What you're interested in is the sample here. You want to know what's on that slide. You can't see it. You illuminate it with a special pattern. You measure this. But what you're interested in is not that measurement. It's this, this information about the object. So that's why we need to do some math now to find out how can we take from a measurement like this, how can we get back to this object information. And there's something else I want to show you. It's a funny effect. If I, if I relatively move the phases of the two, you see that the, um, the color sort of the, the gray values change. Yeah? So you can, you can uh, there's an easy way to manipulate that pattern by simply changing the phase of the illumination, by moving this slightly sideways we're changing the contrast here, and maybe we can use that for the reconstruction. You will see in a minute that this is very helpful information that allows us to, to interpret that much easier. All right. Um, for you uh, to not get bored, uh, I give these around so you can play with this. And um, as a little hint, there's two patterns on it. One is like this, and one, you cross them, and you will, you will see a different face, and you can try to guess who that guy is. I have more of these. So now I lost my pointer. Here it is. So, um, in a nutshell, we have an object with a high frequency information on it. In a normal microscope, we can't see it because it's beyond the resolution limit. Now, what we do is we take a grating and we overlay that grating on the object and you get these relatively coarse stripes, which we can then even measure in a microscope. Of course, they look a little bit different, a bit more fuzzy than I've presented it here, but just you get the idea. And so we can measure this. And therefore, well, we can hopefully then reconstruct our object. So what you see here is that this is a phenomenon you see in everyday life all the time. Once you alert to it, you probably see it at least twice per day or so. These more array effects that so I, I'm sure many of you have seen it already. Mathematically, what, what do we have? It's actually not complicated because I can describe the emission pattern as a multiplication of the object density with the excitation intensity, the local one. Okay, I have to say one very, very important thing. I'm talking all the time about fluorescence and only fluorescence. So in the coherent world of optics, things would be very different and wouldn't work that way that I present them here. But you have to Remember, we are talking about fluorescence, and fluorescence has a complete loss of phase information. That means that the emitted light has always a random phase, and every time you do it, it's different. And so in the end, it is totally safe to add up intensities, which means we, we can describe it as a linear system in the world of intensity rather than a linear system in the world of amplitudes. Okay? That's, that's an important statement. We're talking fluorescence, and what I present Today only works that way for fluorescence. I, I stressed that. No, you can't. You can, you can, of course, do the same experiments with reflection or scattering and, and, and something like this. Resolution enhancement compared to what you put into it. Yeah, it only works for fluorescence where you lose the phase information. And I'm happy to have lots of discussions on that maybe later, but let's, let's understand how it works in the incoherent world. Okay, so we have an emission pattern described being proportional to the object density, which makes a lot of sense, double as many fluorophores, double as much light out, and we have it proportional to the excitation intensity, meaning double as much input light, we get double as much light out as well, locally. And of course, if we translate that statement to Fourier space, because some things in optics are easier to understand in Fourier space, it becomes a nasty convolution. I hope everybody knows roughly what a convolution is. A convolution is in pictures, you draw something with a brush. Yeah? So as you know, a microscope image can be modeled as a convolution of fluorescence distribution. We have to convolve EM with the point spread function, i.e. the brush. 
That means we draw the object with the brush, we get a picture in the microscope, okay? But here it's the other way around. We have a multiplication in real space. We get a convolution drawing with the brush operation in Fourier space. Okay, let's look at that in pictures. Well, we don't really know what the object is. It's, that's what we are interested in, right? So I will just draw some dummy thing for it because I don't know what it is. But we do know what we illuminate with. And in the simplest case, we illuminate with the interference of, of a split light beam, of a laser. So basically, you can think of it as a totally detuned Michelson interferometer or something like this. So you're interfering a laser beam coming from this side with a laser beam coming from this side. So what you get is what people call a standing wave. So you will have slices or planes of high intensity, directly neighboring planes of darkness, and many of them. Okay? That's our illumination pattern. And we make that as final as we possibly can. So ideally, we try to put our beams from these sides. If we want to go through the objective for convenience reasons, we just go at the edge of the aperture so that they come under the highest possible angle inside the limit. All right? So, these interfering waves, they will generate an intensity distribution that you can describe by a sine square. It's, it's a, the interference, the amplitude will be a sine wave, and if you square it, you get, you get a, the intensity pattern of the standing wave. A sine squared, you can as, again write as a constant plus a sine wave of double frequency. And this is what you see here. The constant Fourier transforms gives you a delta peak at zero frequency, and the sine wave gives you a delta peak at plus k and minus k. k referring to the k of that sine wave, the spatial frequency of that sine wave. And what I've also done is, you see here it says phi zero and minus phi zero. I wrote that there because I want to not forget that we can actually, by changing the relative phases of these two beams, we can make that pattern shift in space, right? We can, we can make the maxima to minima, if you like, by just putting a little bit of de delay in there or so. And that means that this one gets a complex value e to the i phi, and this one gets a complex value e to the minus i phi. By the way, this is very generally true because there's a theorem called the Fourier shift theorem. That means if you're in real space shifting anything in Fourier space, you're multiplying with an e to the i k delta x. So since this is a certain k plus k and a certain shift delta x in real space, we get a plus phi. And here, because it's a minus k, you get a minus phi, so to say. But if we had a second peak here or something like this, then this would get a 2 phi, and the next one would get a 3 phi, and so on. Okay? Right, so now I said we have to, to describe the emission pattern. We have to convolve the two things. That means we have to make a convolution of our three delta peaks uh, with the, the object. Uh, it doesn't matter in a convolution which one is which because it's symmetrical. So you can think of um, drawing our unknown Fourier transform object with three pencils basically simultaneously. Or you can think of um, the three pencils being drawn with the object, it gives you the same result, right? So never mind, but what it really means is we have three shifted copies of our Fourier transformed object attached at these three peaks, so to say, and they are summed up, and that, that in the end is our emission pattern. So what I've also, in, of course, this would continue here, and it's the funny sum of these shifted components. So that's how the Moray effect really looks like in Fourier space, if you want. Is, is that part clear? Now I get more question marks on the faces suddenly. So why, where did I lose you? No, everything fine? Okay. So we have this fun of the three shifted objects and let, let us call them from now on components, object components. And the reason is the following. Um, this is the Abe limit. So we are able to somehow obtain information from here to here. And we have the funny mix. If we were able to so now unmix that mess and from these measurements of, of these curves here, get back our object components, then we can sort of shift them where they should belong, stitch them together, so to say, and get a good quality high resolution image. And that's the whole point of structured illumination microscopy. Okay, um, of course what we measure is not that, but we have to go, this is just the emission pattern, so we have to now go through our microscope to image it onto our camera. 
Yeah, and that means in real space, convolution, it means in Fourier space, and that's why we went to Fourier space, a simple multiplication. Multiplication with the Fourier transform of the optical, um, of the point spread function, which is called the optical transfer function in this case, the incoherent transfer function. And that transfer function very roughly looks like a triangular function that goes down. So what we measure is curves like this. And as you can now see, the trick is if we move this illumination pattern, we are altering the relative weight, if you want, of these three components. But in this case, it's not the weight by making one very strong and the other one zero or something like this, but it's a complex valued weight by changing the phase of these things. But that's just as useful. So what we really have, if you think about it, if we were able to measure three points here in Fourier space of at one spatial frequencies, with three points, we, we can maybe solve the equation system and disentangle it to get the three components. Can you see that? It is a linear equation system. So in other words, it's a very similar problem than, let's say, I have a funny balance that works only once you put more than 100 kilograms on it. That's sort of the minimum value, otherwise it's not accurate or something like this. So now my task is to measure the weight of you, you three guys. How would I do that? Well, I could put you on the balance, but maybe you wouldn't be quite the 100 kilograms that it requires. So we have to put always two people on the balance. I put you and you, and we write down the weight. And I put you and you, and write down the weight. I put you and you, and write down the weight. I have three measurements, three combinations, but now I need math to figure out what's going on. Yeah? So you have to write down equation systems. You get a big matrix, and you invert the matrix. And then you multiply that inverted matrix with our measurements, and you get the individual weights. And that is precisely what you do in SIM as well. You can write down that, that matrix. It turns out to be an extremely simple matrix in a way. If you really want to know, it is actually, the matrix is a Fourier transformation along the, the, the dimension of measurements. Yeah? The, the matrix that you get is, 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 in the end, doing a Fourier transformation. It doesn't really matter because we use it as a matrix because we want to account also for errors in these phases. So if the phase is not precisely what, what it should have been, then you want to sort of correct for it. So that's why we really write it down as a matrix. So, okay. So now, now let's put all the puzzle pieces together. So we make three measurements like this. They will have variations like you saw in our images. We can Fourier transform the image, we get sort of something like this. Step one of our reconstruction is we correct for this effect that the optical transfer function does. Essentially, we divide by the transfer function. There's a little star at that thing, because we will come back to that. It's not quite that simple, but in theory, we divide by it. Second thing is, we extract the components with the help of this inverse matrix. We take the three measurements, we apply the matrix, we get back the three components, now we have them individual. Yes. The bits where you said yeah, I shouldn't have said that. That just confused everybody suddenly. Transform of what? If you answer it, I'll no. Um, <laughs> what I what I was saying is, if you have these three measurements, yeah. yeah then then you have several axes x, y, z, and so on. But there's also the axes of phi's. Yeah. Yeah. Along and that and along that axis, you, you can do a Fourier transform. That just turns out to, to do the matrix, and it basically is just telling you the analytical solution of that, that matrix equation. Yeah, but it... it okay. So some people, um, I, I just think, yeah. uh, might, might see the similarity with phase shifting algorithms. Exactly. In interferometry. It's exactly the same as phase shifting in interferometry or holography. Yeah, it's very similar, except the last step. Um, in, in these interferometric things, you, you often do some quadrature approaches, and that's what we don't do here. But, but it is very similar. Um, right, so again, step one, correct it. Step two, extract the components by the measurements, the inverse matrix application. Well, step three is put them where they should belong. That's easy. This central component is, is anyway in the right place, and it just turns out that it's that's that's the ordinary microscope image you would have if you just illuminate it with an equally um, wide screen, so to say. Yeah? Yeah, it's the sum over the pictures. And so that, that's what you get there. That's not, not exciting because it doesn't give us any super resolution, but at least we have the normal image again. However, much more interesting is the component that was, was attached to the plus 
k peak, because when we now shift it where it should be really living, you see that we've gained some part that is theoretically completely not, not accessible because it's beyond the other limit. And the same from, from the other side. So you see that it's not some computational trick we are doing. It's really the fact that we are able to attach our object here and we are measuring all the way over to here. And that's why instead of on a normal way, we have only from here to here, we now have twice as much because we can sort of go from the right side of our frequencies to the left side of our frequencies. Yeah. Right, and then we have to do something that I call weighted averaging. And that's where I'm gonna correct my cheating in the first bit because correcting for the optical transfer function is all theoretically really nice, but it's a function that goes to zero. So dividing by something that goes to zero doesn't sound like a brilliant idea because it means you're multi multiplying close to this point, you're multiplying first with 100, then with 1,000, then with a million and something like this. So that means if there's noise and the noise doesn't care about other limit and spatial frequencies, it's everywhere, you're multiplying the noise with 1,000 and then you just get noise as a result. So not so useful, right? So we have to fix that. But Look at this. Um, theoretically, we still do it, but in this step weighted averaging, we can say here, our signal is infinitely bad of the black curve. But the pink curve is pretty good because it comes from the middle where we didn't have to divide with a lot. And here they are about equally good. And here, the pink one is pretty bad because it comes from the, this side, and, but the black one is good, and so on. So what you do is a frequency dependent weight of the averaging of the two. And does anybody know, it's an extremely simple question, but if you have two measurements with two uncertainties, let's say I give you, I don't know what, we, we after a drinking contest, have a measurement of how long is that. And I'm, <laughs> I'm really drunk, and so my, my error is pretty bad. Whereas you hadn't quite had as much, and um, your, your measurement error isn't so bad, right? But, but still, we, let's say, we all drank a lot and you're the only sober guy here. So um, then, then you have lots of measurements with a bad uncertainty and you have one good one. What are you gonna do now? You can say I discard all the bad ones and I just take the good one. But maybe on average the bad ones are even better. So that calls for weighted averaging. But what is the precise equation you're gonna use if you have to average if there's two values with two different uncertainties? Does anybody know? Sorry? By almost, almost. You de you, yes. So sig sigma is the standard deviation, and it turns out you, you have to weight them with the inverse variance. So one over sigma square is the correct weight to apply. So that means you take one over sigma one square times the first value, one over sigma two square times the second value, and then of course you have to divide by the sum of the weights. So one over sigma one squared plus one over sigma two squared. And that you can prove for Gaussian error propagation is really the best, the optimum that you can do. And of course, if there's one really good measurement, you give it a very high weight and, and your measurement doesn't become terribly better because you've added a bad one to it, but a little bit better. Okay. So, and at the end we have to do what I call apodization. What I mean by that is simply the fact that here we are still left with nothing else to average with. So we have to make sure that this curve does approach zero again. So we are multiplying with a new transfer function if you want that we can construct at, at will. Yeah, we can make it any way we like, but we just have to make sure that, that we, we get down to zero here. There's a, there's a reason to take particular functions there. Um, you can do some, some Wiener filtering step that optimizes for certain conditions the, the signal to noise in that range so that, that you do it the right way, so to say. We can discuss that later. So I want to put what I've now explained to you in, in pictures together again. So this is our a simulated object, and now this is our illumination. We put the two together. We get some sort of emission pattern like this. So this is the response of our sample. What does that mean in Fourier space? Well, in Fourier space, our object is sort of, we get three copies of it and they are overlapped like this. And now, then comes the microscope imaging, so the image will become blurry, or in other words, we'll sort of stencil out a certain range in Fourier space and everything else is lost outside. So now we take our three images and we correct for the effect of the transfer function, I sort of left that away. We disentangle the components, shift them back into place, join them back together, do the weighted averaging, and there is our, so, so to say, high-resolution 
uh, thing in Fourier space, we have to, of course, back Fourier transform the result to get a nice image. But what you also see, this is all very well, but we, of course, in a two-dimensional image, we have to do that for a couple of directions. If we do it for only one direction, we get a resolution improvement along x, but nothing along y. And since you usually want a good picture, you need to do, repeat it. Yes, please, sorry. That is a very good question. So the question was, how do you determine the spatial frequency? And of course, I could say, we know what we do. We can measure the angle of what we put in. But you are perfectly right. It's not that simple. If you try that, it's not precise enough. You need to know that spatial frequency terribly accurate. That means to a few nanometer precision over your whole field of view or something like this. And I'll get back to that in a bit, because you have to do algorithms that determine it from the images and then you get very accurate values for it. So, okay. So, experimental setup. How do you actually do something like this? This is a slightly more complicated setup, but um, it's, it's actually very simple. So what you do is, this is the position where in an ordinary microscope there's the field stop. The field stop, as you know, gets imaged into your object. So if we put in this position a diffraction grating, we'll get an image of the diffraction grating here. And if we now illuminate it intentionally with a laser instead of um, an incoherent light source, it turns out that we can get a very good, well, we get a very high frequency interference pattern in there. And this high frequency pattern can, ha can have very close to 100% contrast. There's, there's only, in the simplest case, if this was a zero pi phase grating, we would not get a zero diffraction order, so it leaves us with two orders that are interfering and gives us the highest possible frequency if we make this grating smaller and smaller. Eventually, it will be beyond the Abel limit and you will get nothing. Actually, then it will be dark in this case. But as soon as both orders go into the objective, they're in there, they interfere, and they give you 100% contrast. So the cool thing by doing this with the laser is we are not really limited by a decaying transfer function. We are, we are doing it in the coherent world for illumination, so we are limited by the pupil function, and as soon as we go in there, we are fine. Yeah? There's one little, little but there. I don't know if somebody spotted the but. The but is take care of polarization. Because if you're interfering two beams under 45 degree angle that are polarized like this, Nice try, but they're not going to interfere the way you think they would. Yeah, what would happen is you would get some funny polarization modulation over your space, but you wouldn't get the intensity contrast that we want. So in this case, you have to make sure they are azimuthally polarized. And indeed, we do that in our experimental setup. We make the polarization always azimuthal to, to the, the way they interfere. OK, so the setup is really simple. What I've shown you here is a slightly more complicated situation because I put a grating in that's not a zero pi phase grating, but it's some grating that has also a zero order. Well, a normal amplitude grating would have that, or a zero whatever, not quite two pi phase grating, or, or a different aspect ratio, for example, of the grating would have that. So that means you have now three orders interfering, which is interesting because it makes you, along the optical axis, um, it makes you a three-dimensional interference structure. Yeah, so that's not any longer the, the, the standing wave picture you had before of these planes of interference, but it becomes actually like a woodpile structure that's doing this all the time. You know this effect in, in you would still have grating lines, but if you defocus them, they would sort of start to blur a little bit, and suddenly they reappear with a phase shift, and then they do this again and again and again. And this effect is well known in optics. It's called the Talbot effect. It's a self-interference re-imaging effect that you always have after gratings. Yeah, so that's what's happening here. It's a Talbo effect in 3D. We have a, well, wood pile structure here. Okay, and then we can move this. It turns out that this will give you more of these orders. Instead of three, you have, uh, if you think in the 2D world, you would have five such orders. And that means instead of having to take three images, we have to take five images, but since they are different positions, it's a simple shift. Same math applies, just the matrix becomes a little bit bigger. OK? Good. So there we go. Um, with that, you can do really cool images. Um, here's an example. Um, the, the first really good image was published by Mats Gustafsson. And you see here, wide field image. 
of a tubulin network in a cell, and this is the high-resolution structured illumination image. And he's also applied it for a three-dimensional set. Um, I, don't, I don't have the time to really go into the 3D theory of it, but the, the transfer function goes from some funny shape like this in a normal wide field microscope into a shape like this where you've doubled the resolution in X, Y, and Z, and you filled the missing cone problem in a, in a wide field microscope. So uh, here's one example of, of an image. So this is an, a part of a cell, actin cytoskeleton. And what you see is these sort of um, structured illumination on it. And uh, I have to maybe stress that when you do these experiments yourself, it's actually fairly simple to build a structured illumination microscope. But the, the one thing is important, you should do it co coherently, because only then, in the, in the illumination, only then you can get this really big contrast. So there's many publications that are called structured illumination, but if you look in detail, they did use, for example, just the beamer um, a video projector or something like that. That's all fine, but that means your illumination structure will have, when it's close to the limit, zero contrast. And that's not very useful, right? So you really want to do it with a laser because then you can get 100% contrast at the limit. So I would, I would make a distinction between sort of true super resolution structured illumination method, methods that really try to get the biggest contrast at the highest frequency into, into your illumination structure and the ones that do it incoherently, the same effect you get when, when you just tell your laser scanner in a confocal microscope only illuminate every second line. You also get a structure, but it has the same problem. Once the structure becomes really close because it's an incoherent superposition in time, it washes out everything and no contrast left, so to say. That's one thing. The other thing is that the biggest mistake that many people do when they try to do structural illumination, they do everything right and they, they get the first data set and say, I can't see my structure, there's nothing in there. And it's not true. The reason is that if you're really at the limit, this high frequency peak, even though it's 100% there, will be dimmed down in the detection to zero. And the transfer function of your detection goes to zero there, and that's why you don't see it. So not seeing a peak doesn't necessarily mean that you haven't done the right experiment. It just means you haven't quite applied the math yet. Yeah, so so don't, that, don't get dis, discouraged if you, if you can't see the structure. And also in the images, even here it's already hard to see. And since this is a three-beam interference, i.e. five-order structure, you, um, you can see what you see here, the, the little bit of interference structure you can see corresponds to the low-intensity order. That's only halfway of what you're really interested in because the most interesting ones are the ones that are touched here. In this case, since they, this experiment didn't quite go to 99% to of the illumination frequencies possible, it only went to whatever, 80%, you can still see the position of attachment of these peaks. The reason is that the object uh, spatial frequency zero is very, very strong in every object, and so it still pops up and you, sh you see it often. Yeah? But it depends also on the samples. This is a particularly nice sample with lots of uh, structure in it. But if you, you, if you use as calibrating uh, beads or something like this, it's very hard to see these peaks here. Yes? Yeah, that's what, what should be done. Um, I have to admit that this is very rarely done. So I think what you're saying is that um, so to see if it's... Fourier yeah. and you do it uh, the, the official way, so to speak. The yeah, yeah, yeah. To I totally DNA. agree. Yeah. Uh, what's the difference? Um, well, they should show you the same structure, right? Um, it, it, as I said, it, it has been rarely done. Um, so, so what you're suggesting is take, take an NA 0.5, do structured illumination, so it should get you to about one, and compare it with, with what you see at one, right? And, and I totally agree that would be the, the right measurement to do it. Most people don't do it. In a way, um, it's even simpler than, than trying to do structured illumination for a high NA objective with one, because um, the, the lower the NA, the less problems you have with polarization, right? You don't need to worry so much about polarization. If the beams are coming under low angles, they will interfere fine. Okay, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't even know a single publication where they, they've really done exactly that. And uh, I know that you can do it and you should do it, but we also we haven't done it so far. Sounds like a plan. Yeah. <laughs>
Good. Um, so I want to show you, this is how a single image looks like. You take five of these images, and that allows you with the mathematics to extract the plus second component. That's the extracted first component. That's the extracted central component, minus first, minus second. Well, and then you repeat that experiment in three directions of, of your structure. You might take a motor and rotate your grating, do it again, and so on. Um, this is just to indicate the resolution improvement now goes from here to here, and that's why if you put it all together like this, big puzzle, you join it, and now you have twice the resolution in X, Y, and in Z, if you do that right in Z. Yes? Oh, yeah, there's, there's several ways you can control the phase of the illumination gating, i.e., well, the first thing is you shift it. You mount it on a piezo, and, and you move it with the piezo. If, if you have no piezo for your grating, you can use your object as well. And actually, the first experiments I, I did a long time ago on, on structural illumination, I think, is it? Oh, yeah, so that, just, just one second. Um, so if, if I take this, um, this would be the wide field image of our actin filaments. And if I take now the structural illumination reconstruction, you're getting from there to there. So there's a clear resolution improvement, no doubt about it. But you're right, it should really be proven that this is really the structure you should be seeing. Um, this, this is the first publication in, in 1999 where we did this. And uh, you see the, the effect again. This is the, the beads uh, on a slide low resolution and structural illumination. The contrast is not terribly good here. Um, I think maybe at some point we might want to dim the light a bit. I don't know if that's possible. So then you can see the, the images nicer. Um, so what you see here is an another great example of Mats Gustafsson. Oh, oh yeah, I wanted to tell you about this thing, how I did that. I didn't have, um, I, I didn't have a laser, first of all, and I didn't have a motor when I was doing my PhD. So what I ended up doing is I was sort of tapping the sample and taking 10, 20 images, and every time the sample moved to some random position, and then I shifted all the samples back together, so I had sort of randomized phases, and I picked the right ones in the end, and I, I reconstructed the image. So there's always a, a okay, a slightly cumbersome solution to that problem, <laughs> but you can, you can get around budget problems with, with easy tricks, right? Um, so this is a, a really great, uh, another example of Matz's group, uh, structural illumination, what you can see here is uh, mitochondria in a cell. So these are where the energy gets sort of produced for the cell or, I mean, made from one unit of energy into another unit of energy. And uh, if you look closely, again, that you can probably not see from that distance, but you can even see inside these mitochondria the substructures, the crystal structures. So you see the membranes that are inside there, which is kind of cool. And that is a 3D version of the same. This is another nice example, um, also from Matz's group, multicolor. They did um, uh, growth cones. This is a growth cone of a neuron. So you see actin and the cytosol label in here. And OK, so that, yeah, I'm, I'm starting to seriously run over time at the moment, but we'll see. Um, the next little bit would be to tell you, to answer your question, how do you get these parameters really, right? And uh, Turns out there's a hell lot of parameters that you don't know precisely enough. The grating constant, like you said, the, the grating constant. The orientation of the grating, it might be wrong by half a degree or something like this. The local phase, meaning when you're shifting the grating, did you really shift it by the right amount or maybe slightly wrong? The global phase means what is precisely the bright line in the grating in the first one. Even if you know the relative phases, you need to know eventually how they are globally because only then you can join them. Um, I, I sort of skipped that part, but the, the extracted component might still have a phase orientation to the first one. You need to know that to, to rotate it in complex plane into the right orientation. And um, the contrast of the orders, you might need to know as well. Um, the local illumination intensity of every image, it might fluctuate over your time series. And uh, if there's a drift in the sample, you want to correct that as well. So lots of things you, you, you really need to know for a good reconstruction, but you have to figure them out for the images itself because they can't be known easily from your experiment. So I'm, I'm going to show you a little bit the first bit. First of all, um, what, what happens if you don't get it right? So basically, you see if you do a reconstruction with, with wrong parameters, slightly wrong parameters for, for the grating constant, it's just a little bit wrong 
by a few, maybe a percent or less, then you will get effects like this. There will be a bright region here, even though it should look like this, and a dark region here. This is, of course, a simulation, but just to show you, it's, it's the roof of King's Cross Station in London, actually. Um, uh, and another thing you might notice, uh, sometimes you can also get sort of splittings of lines. Um, so if you correct it, you go from here to here, much nicer image in the end. Um, so how do you actually do it? And you do it like this. You, turns out you can do this extraction only with the knowledge of the relative phase. Yeah? So if, as long as you shift them by one third of the period, you're totally fine. It doesn't matter what the grading constant actually is. Yeah? And that you can get at least roughly right. So separation of the components works fine. Once you have them separated, what you can do is you can use this overlap area where you've measured the same thing essentially twice. And you're cross-correlating them, and from the cross-correlation, you can find out very precisely what your grading constant is. And it turns out that you need to find that out by much better than one pixel in Fourier space. And simply fitting something to the cross-correlation peak and trying to get a sub-pixel position is not good enough. You need to do it iteratively. So you basically Determine it once with a fit, if you like, and then you correct for it and try again. And the correcting you can do with the Fourier shift theorem again. And so you, you do this a couple of times and optimize the, the peak. And this way you can then find a very precise, typically the precision is better than a tenth of a pixel in Fourier space uh, about this cross-correlation. Then you're fine. Um, and with that, uh, yeah, the, that, that also solves the, sorry, that solves the problem of the grading orientation as well because it, you can do it in, you get a 2D, two-dimensional peak, X and Y position, so you know orientation and length of it. Good, um, next problem, local phase, global phase, and order contrast. You can actually also look at these cross correlations, but um, we wanted a very robust algorithm, so um, we basically looked at the errors that happen if you do it wrong. And then we, we make corrections until this sort of measurement of error goes down. And if you basically have a slightly wrong local phase of illumination, let's say it wasn't one third of the period, but it was only a quarter or something like that, yeah, then you will not unmix the components correctly. And if you have here such a thing that should be, for example, component zero, you haven't done it right, you have some leftovers at the positions where you know where they should be, these positions, where the zero frequencies of the object end up. And since you know where that is relatively well, or very precisely actually, you can quantify the error. And we came up with different error metrics of how to measure that, and, and they are sort of summarized in these matrices. And we look at not only the zero component, but the first and the second component, and all these positions. So in this one, where the green arrow is where, where, is where you are expecting a peak, and the red ones are the bad ones. You shouldn't have them. And here it's the other way around. You should expect something here, but nothing there and there and there, and so on. And we then just make some sort of metric that, that makes something like the ratio of the, the, the strength and the red arrow and the green arrow. Actually, it's a bit more involved because um, it's okay to have some values here, but they shouldn't be peaky. So we, have, we measure the peakiness or something like this in these regions. And then you summarize that in the matrix, and then we have an iterative algorithm that optimizes it. But that sounds terribly slow because for every time, it sounds like you need Fourier transforms of the whole image, and that becomes really slow. Turns out that this mathematics, you can pull through the Fourier transforms, and, and that allows you, uh, with some tricks, to, to relatively quickly do this optimization of the phase. Yeah, because you're not, you, you know precisely where to measure, so you can sort of pre-correlate the image information once, and then you do it with the correlated information. Um, so if you correct it, you see now everything is clean, and you get it exactly the way you want it, and then you put the things together, and then you have less artifacts in it. Um, good question. Um, so how, how much does it depend on, on the sample and so on? Um, we do it um, at the moment all the time for every new image, essentially. Um, but I think if you take a time series of a sample, it's not necessary to do it all the time. Maybe it's enough every tenth or every hundredth image to sort of do this recalibration. So we are starting to think in that direction because we want to make algorithms that, that work 
live speed so that you can look at cells doing their thing and you can watch it live going on and you can, uh, yeah, and then you don't have the time to do all these relatively complicated calculations all the time. So we, we, we want to say, okay, maybe only every tenth image we sort of spawn off a recalibrate task and go on showing images basically, yeah. But we haven't figured that out yet. Um, so it turns out actually um, that there is a much simpler way to get almost the same results than what I show you here by looking at individual image. Because if you think about it, every individual image contains the knowledge about the phase of illumination, the local phase, and that's all you need to know really. And if you do autocorrelations of that image information, the autocorrelation shows you a peak, even if the peak is not visible inside, because a shifted version of that image should somehow correlate with itself. Yeah? And from these autocorrelations, you can then figure out what you need to know. And Kai Wicker and my group worked that out, and it, it, it works like a charm. So it's, it's really a much easier way to do it. Um, maybe not quite as robust, maybe not exactly the same precision, but it's only a few percent or so. Um, so this is actually, if you do a reconstruction with, with uh, the theoretical phases, and if you then do the phase correction, you see that these artifacts here disappear. And because in Fourier space, the peaks here disappear. And yeah, um, global phase error, I, I don't want to go into that. It, you can actually see it from the Fourier transforms a little bit, and you get these typical splitting effects of lines here. They become double lines, yeah. So that's, you, you know, I was advertising do it with a computer, but you see also the lots of problems you get, yeah. Uh, normal optics wouldn't get you into that sort of troubles. But of course, aberrations and so on, yes. But um, if you do it with a computer and it's a complicated thing, then the, then the errors you're going to see are also quite complicated. Sorry, I mean, yeah. That's, huh? No There's no free lunch, exactly. That's what I wanted to say. Uh, good. Um, let me, let me speed up a bit. Um, this, this, this next bit was actually about um, um, mathematical things that have to do with the algorithm um, that you can think about, mathematical problems that actually we haven't really put into the, it yet, but it's interesting. So just how can you fit a line through lots of points where the error distribution is distributed like this in a more complicated way than normally? And this is not contained in the ordinary fitting packages that you get from, from the manufacturers, so to say. Yeah? So you have to think how to do that. It's not, it's not trivial. Um, we haven't done it yet, but we know roughly which way to probably go. There's something called Steiner's theorem that allows you to calculate the, the, the inertia moments, moments when you move them along from a, from a certain position to a different position. And this can be used to solve that problem of how to fit a line the best way through an error distribution that's complicated. Um, yeah, let me, I think this is all not so, so interesting. Actually, I can put the, the PDF of this online somewhere and you can look at this if, if you're interested. Um, yeah, how to do it fa faster, that was what I said before. If you do the individual image correlations, you can do it in a faster way. And you see here a comparison of a single step algorithm to the iterative algorithm. And except for very, very, very bad signal to noise where the iterative one is, is significantly better for all other situations they are okay, and actually even the single step seems to be in some way more robust, which we don't really understand, but. Um, yeah, and you see here's the comparison between uh, iterative and single phase, and you see no, no visual difference about the quality of reconstruction there. Fine. Um, the Wiener filter problem is still a problem, which is the, the current way, um, the, the last step, what you do is this weighted averaging and the apodization, and this can be summarized in a, in a Wiener filtering approach, but a Wiener filtering makes fundamentally wrong assumptions about your sample. It assumes that there's an equal amount of noise everywhere, which is absolutely not the case. Bright stuff has much more noise than dim stuff because it's Poisson distributed. Uh, and uh, there's no simple algorithm that can figure it out. Of course, you can do iterative deconvolution algorithms, but they're significantly slower. And we are still seeing to find good compromises between both worlds. The one Fourier transform algorithm is the Wiener filtering, but maybe there can be done something in between. And we are right now working on that um, uh, because we, are, we, are now, we, we managed to now model the error distribution through the whole process of reconstruction. So we can basically predict what's the error in every pixel and that then hopefully will allow us to also get better reconstruction results. Um, 
This is an interesting theoretical problem. Um, the question is what, I said you can sort of choose your transfer function for the end, but what properties do you want and what's the ideal transfer function to choose? And it turns out that this problem is very old and you can find in a publication by, by Dennis Gabor from 19, I don't know what, 1915 maybe or so, in, in that range, you can find a, a statement about that. And he recommends using a cosine shape curve that, that I think that's the, the, the sign here, the, the, the green curve or cosine, I would say. And uh, that has certain properties which are, which, which are um, minimizing a certain quantity. And uh, that would be one way to go. But there's, there's, of course, several solutions depending on what you like and what you don't like. But um, there's also, interestingly, you can prove that there is no way you can make a function that never goes negative. Because somehow you think, okay, I, I don't want a, a final point spread function that goes negative because there's no sense in negative intensities. But there is none that is frequency limited. So you cannot make any function frequency limit and non-negative. Uh, no, wait. Sorry, I'm messing it up now. Um, what was about it? No, you cannot have it monotonous, mo monotonously decaying only, so that would be ideal, like a Gaussian or something like this. It's monotonously decaying and frequency limited. And that, that doesn't work together. You can't, you can't have some function that decays monotonously, never has a side lobe, uh, and is frequency limited. Uh, even though that would be what you maybe like. Uh, but you can, of course, make good compromise between it with a bit of abortization with extremely low side lobes, fine. Okay, so um, there's also something interesting called the Lukosz bound that you can apply there. I'm, I, I'm not such a big fan of it. That has to do with the positivity, actually. Um, so this is a, the setup that we currently have in our lab. And as you see, we've replaced the grating with a spatial light modulator. So th these things you can get from video projectors, essentially. This one is, uh, is a special one because it uses a ferroelectric type of liquid crystal, and uh, that is very fast. So we can, we can run this at more than 1,000 frames per second. Uh, the disadvantage is digital, and we lose a hell lot of light in this thing. So from the laser to our illumination here, we have about 1% or 2% of the light left, which then becomes a problem because you need to buy expensive lasers to have enough light to do something useful with it. And so... Um, but uh, with other light modulators, you are much more eff effective than with this ferroelectric one. Um, digital mirrors would also be enough, but then you have an amplitude modulation, which means if you're then picking out the orders you want, and there's this, this thing here called passive Fourier filter, which essentially, well, it's not essentially, it's a piece of paper where we, where we took a needle and we punched holes in the positions where we want the diffraction orders to go through. And um, you have to get a bit of practice, so you have to waste a couple of pages of paper until you get it right, but <laughs> that's okay. Um, so yeah, th this has to be selecting precisely the orders, and we have an algorithm that, that iteratively searches for the right patterns to display, so to just get us the right light that we don't get stray light from other patterns in there. Um, and here's a bit of polarization control. This one, um, here it says azimuthal polarizer, which of course you can buy it from a company. It's terribly expensive if you want. We've now switched over to a, a mode uh, of eBay, which means uh, I bought on eBay um, from some American company quarter wave plates, but they are just the raw material of it. It's, it's sliced mica or something. And it was really not expensive. I think I paid 50 euro and I get 20 of them or something like that. Yeah, so really not expensive. And then you can, it turns out you can take a scissor and cut them with a scissor because this mica is, is like paper almost. You can cut it like this. And so we, we then cut them and rearranged them and rotated them in a way that we can then get the whole polarization azimuthal thing with, with these mica plates. Um, and yeah, here you see uh, some the first results. So this is a total raw, uh, 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 no, a raw frame range of 62 images, and then we've worked more and more. Um, and I will show you in a, in, a, in a minute another example where we went up to seven more than 700 frames per second raw data. Of course, I have to say one thing: uh, to get really good data, you need a good camera, and we are using very expensive cameras for that. 
but uh, from the if, if you are happy with slightly less quality uh, and speed, you, you can use in, industrial grade cameras and they become cheap. Or mobile phone cameras, they are actually maybe even better than the really expensive ones, I don't know. Um, so, yeah, what, what, what I wanted to say here is um, these, these cameras, they work in a rolling shutter mode. And that is a problem for structured illumination because ideally you want to expose and then read out your frame and expose and read out. You can do that in these cameras, but then they become relatively slow because they are meant to be sort of operated in a rolling shutter way at 100 frames per second or something like this, which means that you have these lines, I would call the reset and readout line, they run over the frame like this and you can make them larger and larger. So in, in the end, you can sort of reset, read out, and immediately this pixel starts exposing until the line comes by again and, and resets and read out again. Yeah, and that's the ideal world because then you have 100% of your time for exposure and you're still reading out at the highest rate. But of course for SIM that wouldn't work in the normal way. So we made a slightly more complicated illumination scheme to be able to exploit that fast speed of the camera. Because if you think about it, if we, if we have only always exposure and then read out, even if we want to run it out on only 50 hertz, half speed, we have, we have still only 50% duty cycle for exposure. Yeah, and and, and the, the faster you want to go, if we want to run at 90 frames per second, then we have only 10% for exposure. So it's a, it's a vicious cycle in some way. So that's why we came up with a, um, let me skip a bit. Uh, now, now the computer needs some time because there's a movie coming up in a second. Uh, this is the effect of rolling shutters. If you take a picture and the car is moving, yeah, you get funny, funny effects here. Um, but what you should see, hopefully, in the next slide once it comes up, is, is how we so solve that, that problem. So it's a little animation that shows you what we do. So we basically split the frame into different segments. And then we, ex we, we illuminate in a synchronized way with the camera readout so that only that essentially the, the readout and reset line is kind of always kept in the dark and the bit before it displays the new frame, uh, no, sorry, the, the, the old frame, and the bit behind it displays already the new frame. So here you see the effect. So what you see here is the, the sequence of displayed frames, and we basically slice our gratings up into pieces like this, and we display at different times different pieces. And while the read and readout and reset line on the camera run like this, we are sort of displaying the series of seemingly complicated patterns, but if you add them up in the right way, what is actually read out are precisely the patterns that you wanted in the end. And of course, there is theoretical some, some problem at the transition line between here and here because you go slightly incoherent now sequentially. It turns out it didn't hurt. We, we, we didn't see any significant artifacts from that effect. So the images that we got look fine. It's, it's just a bit complicated with the triggering and, and getting everything synchronized. So here you see a result that is structured, that's normal wide field imaging, structured illumination. You can see the increase in resolution. Um, something is wrong with the colors here. So it's at 714 frames per second was the raw data rate. And that means we have about almost 80 frames per second final rate of images. And, and that's important. Um, it's important to circumvent drift problems. And it's important because we want to go, finally want to go to nonlinear structured illumination. And so what does that mean? Well, here is what I've explained to you. We're illuminating with a sinusoidal grating, and we get this effect. But then when you think about it, it's based on this equation, right? Proportionality to object density and proportionality to illumination intensity. But then you can say, oh, what if? What if we were not proportional? So we have something like this. We have some deformation with the intensity. How can this happen? Well, there's lots of physical effects that can give you something like this. So for example, a simple saturation of the fluorescence. If you've ever worked with a confocal microscope, if you put the laser up too high, it will start to saturate the fluorophores. What is meant is that they cannot keep up with the cycling between ground and excited state because it always takes them a certain time to emit a photon, two nanoseconds or something like that. And if, if there's lots of photons coming in, in these two nanoseconds, they're sort of inactive, so they can't re respond. That means you're sort of losing the, the linearity. If you go too bright, they cannot follow up, and it saturates. And that means that in, if, if I go this curve times 1,000, I would be like this. 
but then that's only the start, and then here it saturates. It cannot go brighter than a certain limit, which actually is the radiative rate of the, the fluorophore. Um, and this deformation, uh, for those who play electric guitar, you know when you want to go from Bob Dylan sound to ACDC sound, you have to crank up the, <laughs> the amplifier um, because it gives you higher harmonics, right? And, and that, that makes the squeaky sound. So the same here. The, the nonlinearity in the Fourier sp space comes down to a convolution with this Four, um, Fourier transform of the function applied to the intensity, and that makes the sine wave into a non-sinusoidal wave, and you get higher harmonics here. And luckily, the same tricks work still, because this will automatically rotate at 2 phi, 3 phi, 4 phi. So instead of having to take three images, you now have to take whatever, 25 images or something like this. But you get more and more resolution. In theory, infinite resolution information here. Of course, practically, you have noise everywhere, and if these are too small, everything drowns in the noise, and you won't be able to resolve it. But you've fundamentally gotten rid of the problem of the upper limit. You have now a signal-to-noise problem. And I would make the statement that this is the gist behind almost all super-resolution, at least the one family of the super-resolution methods. So stimulated emission depletion microscope, you can picture the same way. You're getting information from beyond Abbas frequency into the range of measurable frequencies. And um, there's another family. These are the single molecule methods, um, which, which sort of work in a different way. Yeah, they, are, they are very rarely interpreted in the framework of the Abbas limits. And, and Right. So um, these were, were our first attempts to uh, trying to do this uh, nonlinear super resolution. We didn't get uh, didn't get so far. So what you saw was the transition from wide field to normal structured illumination, linear structured illumination, and now comes the transition to the nonlinear, and that's not so so nice as we expected it to be. And first, it takes some time. I don't know. You barely noticed the difference. It went a little bit sharper, but not what we wanted. So that's why we never published this. Uh, however, other groups got, got further, um, particularly Mats Gustafsson's group. Um, they worked on that and applied it then also to biological samples. That was a fixed sample. It's, again, because of the light here, you can't see it, but the, what you would see here is lots of little dots. These are the nuclear pore proteins, and uh, they got to about 60 nan or 50 nanometer resolution for such a fixed sample. And uh, then uh, very prominently about... Um, bit more than a year ago, or almost two, uh, is Eric Betzig. Uh, the next one, once it comes up, sorry, my computer is really slow. Um, there will be two movies once they play, um, and, and these are uh, done with nonlinear structured illumination um, by uh, photoswitchable proteins, and that's the, the most promising route. If you have fluorescent proteins that you can switch several times from a dark state to a bright state and back, you can use that to generate your nonlinearity. And that, that is what is done here. And actually, they went for an, an not so high nonlinearity, but they could still get about 60 nanometer resolution. And then you can see these nice details on the actin uh, cytoskeleton of, of cells uh, that were previously not visible. You see some spiraling patterns in there here, for example, sprouting, sprouting actin activities and so on. Yes? Resolution. Yes. So, and only the ones that are not illuminating are increasing it, so to speak. Yes. So if um, you the other way around, yes. Uh, so um, I, I have to explain a little bit. So the saturation effect that I just showed you indeed has the disadvantage that you sort of have a relatively strong central component, wide field image, and relatively weak higher component. And since the signal to noise comes from the total number of photons, you have you have a relatively bad signal to noise. Yeah? It's not th that the resolution would be worse or something, but it's just the signal to noise is sort of very compromised because of this really strong, or this, this big amount of fluorescence from everywhere. Yes. Um, and you can do it in a different way. So we, we, we like to discriminate between positive and negative saturation. Yeah? So we are doing a, a normal positive saturation, but what you would like to do is more like instead 
you'd like to saturate the, another transition. And that's exactly what, what is done when you use these photoswitchable dyes, because what you're saturating is then the on to off transition. You're saturating, switching it from a bright to a dark state, and this way you can make essentially from a pattern that has very fine lines by lots of background, you, you make it to a pattern that has nothing with small lines on top of it. And that's, that's much better in signal to noise terms. But there's another problem um, with the switching of proteins and molecules, that is molecules are entities and they, they either switch or they don't switch. And, and that means you have a, not, not just the Poisson noise from the photons, but you have the Poisson noise from the switching events. And if the theory of reconstruction, like it is done at the moment, says, okay, this brightness is 80%, it doesn't apply to single molecules. The molecule is either on or off. So to get something close to the 80%, you need to repeat that experiment many times. And that makes it really difficult. You, you need to basically push these molecules through thousands of cycles to get a good reliable estimate of 80% for a molecule. Yeah? So the higher the resolution goes, the more you come to the single molecule regime and you need to account for these effects. It doesn't make a difference. If it's two photon, it still has the problem the molecules on or off, or? No, no, the non-linearity. Ah, the non-linearity. <laughs> yes, you're right. Um, so, molecular switching or saturation of switching kinetics is just one way of doing it. There's, there's several other ways of getting a non-linear response. And you're right, a two photon would be a non-linear response. It has a problem because it's, it's just a square, and just a square gives us just one more peak in the end, that's, so it's not so good in that way. But um, it has another problem, which is much more serious, which is that if you compare it to the wavelengths that you illuminate your photons normally, uh, your, your fluorophores normally with, you now have double the wavelengths. So what you're saying is basically, uh, let's use double the wavelengths and then get back in resolution to what it gives you anyway, so it's, it's not really worth the effort, yeah? You, you don't gain by this, this effect. Uh, using two photons uh, is, for that, not recommended. Of course, if you can exploit the, the two photon sim if you want to go deep into tissue and maybe do something there, that's a different issue. And you should know because we have a common project about this. So, um, right. Um, so the, the, for me now, the question is, I've run over time quite a big bit and I wanted to show you something completely different, which I think is cool. It's much easier to grasp and, and watch because it's, it's more nice images and not so much theory. Um, I would still have about 20 minutes to do that. And so, so I think I better sort of skip over the, the, the final slides here in structural illumination and then show you a little bit of the other thing, okay? Good. Um, so there's some image reconstruction things uh, called blind structural illumination that's about when, when the patterns are not perfect sine waves anymore, can we maybe even detect that and correct for it? And yes, you can and it makes better images and so on. And you can read publications about that. It's not, not really so important to, for the understanding of structured illumination. So that's why I want to summarize this part of the talk. So it's, first of all, you should have learned that linear fluorescent microscopy methods like structured illumination can enhance a factor of two. And what is particularly interesting about structured illumination is that it does that in an efficient way. Why do I say that? Because Colin, for example, already published how many years ago statements that you can get a factor of two resolution improvement uh, in a confocal microscope in fluorescence. And it's true, the upper limit expands by a factor of two. It's just that the, the transfer function becomes so incredibly small out there that it's really, really hard to pull that out of your signal to noise. With deconvolution, you can try to do that, but difficult. Um, structural illumination simply pushes these high frequencies so much that now they're easy to detect. Um, then nonlinear fluorescent method like nonlinear structured illumination or STET can do better. By the way, I should mention what hasn't been done yet. Um, another nonlinear effect is using quantum effects. So for those who know about Rabi oscillations, you can try to push your fluorophores with ultra short pulses into Rabi oscillations. And if you are able to do that repeatedly, you can get a very nice nonlinearity for that. Yeah, but it's not so easy. Nano diamonds, maybe. Um, inner shell transitions of erbium, maybe, uh, but not easy. Um, right, these are collaborators for the structural illumination part, and uh, I want to thank the, the names here in my group that, that contributed to it, um, and, and many, many more people, so 
um, on, on different aspects of structured illumination microscopy. But now I want to go to the second talk. And should we have some questions now, some more, or should we continue with the talk? Any important questions right now? Yes. So the question is if we can do it in transmission. And um, it refers actually to a similar uh, question before, can we do it in reflection and so on. So my answer would be, yes, you can do it, but you gain nothing. What I mean by that is um, in transmission or reflection are always coherent methods that, that you would have to describe in the coherent or partially coherent theory. And in these cases, you will find that if you compare the resolution limit with something like oblique illumination, you get the same final limit. Many people don't know that, but Abbe's original paper, 1983, that he published on the resolution limit, was very specific. Oh, did I say 19? 1870, no. 1873, I think it was, yeah. 1873. Um, so the, where, where he publishes this equation, essentially, first of all, in that whole paper, there's not a single equation written the way we write it today. It's just written in words. This is proportional to this and, and so on, yeah? Um, but uh, it, he basically says, okay, we can get the resolution limit lambda over two in A that you all know, but for the specific case of an oblique illumination. So he first describes the theory with head-on illumination, low in A, and then you get lambda over one in A as the limit, and many people don't know that. And that's why there are so many papers around that always say they have achieved super resolution, and they, they essentially show they are better than head-on illumination, but they, they, they say it's beyond Abbe, but that's not, I mean, that's, that's not the Abbe limit that we know. It's lambda over two in A, it's for oblique illumination. And if you compare with that one, you gain nothing by the whole structure. You, you can think of it like this. It's, it's linear in amplitude, so if you illuminate something with this wave, and you, you were able to measure the amplitude, and you illuminate it with this wave, and you were measure to, to get the amplitude with a hologram or something, and now you do both at the same time, what do you gain? Nothing. And that's what you would then call structured illumination. Yeah, you just get a more complicated looking amplitude, you can disentangle it whatsoever, but it's not helping you in resolution. So scattering doesn't do the trick, basically. Okay. Good. Um, let me switch over to the other presentation. By the way, did you figure out what this other guy was? I don't know if he was old. No, I mean the, the guy on the slides that I gave around, right? Um, any guesses? It was Moret, yeah, maybe, no. It was Friedrich Schiller, and our university is called Friedrich Schiller University, so that's, that's why I put him there. Um, right, so this is going to be a fast run through it because it's, it's meant to take longer than I have time now, but um, the, I think that the basic messages are simple to get. So you might know about light sheet illumination. The trick is there. Instead of illuminating from the top like you normally do, you have a separate optics and you illuminate from the side. Why is that cool? Because you get, if you make this wide enough, it's a bit like maybe in a disco, a laser beam that scans like this or so, it gives you a nice sheet of light and you can make it relatively thin and relatively long. The reason is that basically the thickness scales sort of linearly with the pupil size, but the length, some people call it the Rayleigh length, um, scales with the square. So that means if you, if you are willing to reduce your thickness, to, make, to reduce your resolution or to make the thickness twice as wide, you're going to have four times longer in Z. Yeah? And this is what is used here. So you basically, let's, let's sacrifice a factor of 10 in, in width. So we are, we are talking about instead of 500 nanometer, 5 micron width. But then we have a factor of 100 in length. So over a whole field of view, we can have the, almost the same thickness. Yeah, that's what is done here. That's the ordinary way. But um, so here you see a, a cleared tissue, and we've been working with cleared objects. So this is very old procedures from Spalterholz and so on in the early 1900s. Um, 
they found out how you can put organic material in certain solutions and make them almost completely transparent. So first you bleach a little bit with, with uh, hydrogen peroxide and then you put them in these solutions and they become like a piece of glass. And so this is a whole brain from a mouse that's been put in there, but you can do all kinds of other things. And in this case, this, this data set, when Uli Leishner came to my lab, um, is from, from such a mouse brain. But what you see here is interestingly not the stuff that is um, fluorescing, but it's the stuff that is not fluorescing. So what has been done is the data was taken and then inverted in a computer. And what you see here as bright is actually the dark stuff. And in this case, this is the vessels because there's nothing inside. And it's the nuclei, which for some reason don't fluoresce as well because they don't contain so much protein like the rest. And uh, the fluorescence just comes from the autofluorescence of the material after formalin fixation. So it has been fixed by formalin and that cross linkers everything and that generates a little bit of fluorescence and it's enough for these sort of, uh, for these nicely embedded samples in light sheet illumination. So what we've now done is we wanted to make slightly uh, better compromise by focusing the light now a bit stronger. So instead of having five micron, we want it to go down to almost one micron in thickness. So of course we have the problem now of the massively reduced Rayleigh length. But since this method is really very, very gentle in terms of exposure and bleaching, we can, we can sacrifice a bit of that. And then instead of taking one image, we take several images where we move the position of that light sheet. And we move it with the help of an electrically tunable lens that you can basically put some voltage on it. It changes the shape a little bit and will focus to a different position. And here you see the results. So this is a, a fly, head of a fly that was put uh, in these clearing solutions. And you see now the light sheet is sort of focused from here to here. That's focused to here and so on. And you take several of these images, you stitch them together, do a little bit of deconvolution and you get a data set like this. And that was the moment where I got really scared of flies because they really look like aliens or I don't know what, but if you, if you image them at a resolution of about one micron in X, Y, and Z, that's done here, uh, yeah, then you get pretty cool data. Um, the raw data of just one, one of these images, so to say, I mean, the 3D stack of all the images together was 300 gigabyte because you need a lot of pixels. Um, th this is before the stitching, yeah? so that's just the raw data. Then when you, when you only cut out the pieces, put it back together, and uh, after processing the whole thing, it's still eight gigabytes for one volume, but uh, yeah. So of course the interesting bit is not what is outside, but what is inside, because you have the whole fluorescent data of the whole fly head, and so you, you to a very high level of detail. One micron is not at all super resolution, but it's good enough to see many features, and it's good enough to, for example, see that behind all of these compound eyes, there's always four neurons, and you see them, and they draw into the brain, and you see the switching layers in the brain, and so we had then some, some, some people for us, some biologists, to segment it and give some more interpretation to the data. And so here you see the same data set sort of cut open. These are the muscle groups that are able to operate this sort of trunk-like thing that the fly can actually pull totally inside when it's flying and, and then when it wants to eat some food. This looks really scary. Have you ever seen a, a machine that drills a, a tunnel? This looks really like a tunnel drilling machine. There's like these sharp tooth in the front of the fly, row after row after row. And then it meshes up the apple, pumps out some saliva, sucks in the juice with the fruit, Mm. <laughs> Imagine what you do to the brain. Exactly. So this is the segmented data of the neurons. Uh, so the biologists can somehow from the morphological pe features very precisely tell the different segments of all these, these uh, parts of neurons in the brain. There, uh, the fly ha has this antenna thing on the top and these OO cellae they are called. So with this, it senses the light on the head. I think even humans have something left there, uh, some sort of light sensitive sensor inside or so. Um, and yeah, then you can put the musculature, the pharynx, the digestive system, everything together. So when we had that, we thought this is really cool. That should be really interested, interesting to museums. So because they have these samples from, from 100 years ago that they collected in the Amazon forest of all kinds of tiny insects and so on. Why not put them in our machine and give them back a, a data set at this resolution? And, it turned out um, they were moderately interested in this thing, um, but they didn't have any money whatsoever to pay for any of these experiments, so we didn't do any of that, which is a pity. I think it could 
would still be nice, but um, here you just see the level of detail. This is actually a larva from such a fly, fly larva, um, and the resolution is really uh, one micron or slightly above, and you can see the banding patterns of the muscle if you look carefully here. You see these stripes, which are the Z bands of the musculature in the muscle. Uh, these larvae basically are made for eating. They just eat and eat and eat, so they have a lot of muscles. Um, that's uh, something from the rainforest, a funny animal that the biologists are interested in. Yena is some sort of link animal that hasn't been researched a lot. What is interesting with this guy is it doesn't have eyes, but only if it needs to find mating partners or something to eat because there's nothing left, then it starts to develop eyes and looks around where to go next. This is uh, just about our clearing procedures. We are able to, to also handle complicated tissue, like, like this is lung tissue from a mouse, and it's a bit more difficult to preserve and, and to put in the machine there. Uh, this is also to show that we can preserve uh, the fluorescence of GFP. So these are GFP-labeled neurons in a piece of brain. And um, you see in a minute, this is how the raw data looks like. Now, the interesting bit is we have the positive contrast from the labeled neurons, but at the same time, we have this sort of inverse contrast from all the dark stuff, i.e. the vessels and the nuclei. So you, you can now just by image processing extract the dark stuff and the bright stuff, put it back together, and you get something like a multicolor image, even though it was just a single color image. And that's what you see in a second. So we basically have the, here the inverse stuff, and then we just put it back together, and we get a nice sort of context to the neurons, what is, what is in their surrounding, how many cells are there, where are the vessels going, and so on. Yeah, so here you have the neurons. And the good thing is the resolu resolution is now isotropic because the light sheet is so thin that it matches the resolution we have in X and Y. Good. So... That was the part I wanted to show you about just light sheet imaging with some cool images. And now comes, if I'm allowed, yeah, carry on. Um, a part about a, a combination of Raman microscopy with light sheet imaging. So first of all, what is Raman scattering? I don't know, was it part in this course? Was it mentioned, Raman scattering? So Raman scattering is, is another effect. Um, and if you think fluorescence is weak, well, then look at Raman, because Raman scattering is way weaker than fluorescence. And what happens is basically, uh, physically, it's the, it's the following effect. You have a, a light wave that hits a molecule, and this molecule is sort of, you can imagine, is vibrating all the time. And when it vibrates, it changes a little bit the configuration of itself and the electron clouds. And what happens is basically there's a tiny little bit of a modulation of a feature that is called the polarizability of a material. Yeah, so you can polarize something rather well or not so well, and this polarizability is modulated over time now. So you can excite it sort of, it's, it scatters a bit more this way and a bit less this way, and then a bit more again and a bit less again. So that means the wave that it sort of emits, in, in, if you want, in Rayleigh scattered light, that is a little bit modulated because of its fluctuation. And this tiny modulation of the polarizability leads to a tiny modulation of the amplitude, and this tiny amplitude modulation that means, in addition to the Rayleigh scattered line, you have a little bit of an anti-Stokes and Stokes scattered um, Raman line. So that, that's, in a classical picture, what Raman scattering is. And you may, might get a, an idea why it is so super weak, because it's a tiny effect. And um, now, yeah, I have to say, there are commercial even Raman instruments that, that work like a confocal microscope. And they put a laser here, and then they have a spectrometer, and they take the data. And then they say, ah, let's wait a little bit longer until I get enough photons, because they are so weak. And then they move to the next pixel, and to the next pixel, and so on. So a typical Raman image of biological samples is typically 100 by 100 pixels and takes four hours to acquire. Why? Well, you can crank up the laser intensity, but there's only so much you can do. Eventually, you're just going to evaporate your sample. Yeah. You can actually say you fry your sample, and that's indeed what they see. They, they say we always go to the carbonization limit. You know what the carbonization is when, when you put a schnitzel in? Sorry? 
when you cannot eat it anymore. Yeah, if your schnitzel becomes a piece of coal, that's the carbonization limit. And that's pretty much where they are working in their Raman microscopes. So we thought, hmm, that's maybe not the best way of doing it, going pixel by pixel. Why not use the light sheet idea and illuminate from the side so you get a million times more pixels simultaneously and you can, get, you can then afford to wait much longer for your signal to come, basically. Yeah? Um, so that, that's the idea. A light sheet, what are the properties? Well, the tissue tolerates more, more intensity because the intensity is spread. It recycles the light in a way. What I mean by that is that the, the light that has sort of hit the beginning of the light sheet it's the same light that's used again for the next bit and the next bit and the next bit. So you're, you're more effective in making use of your light. And in a confocal, you're sort of above the plane. You don't need it. You don't need it. Here you're in focus. You need it for a little bit, and then you don't need it again, right? Um, it has this multiplex advantage, but that's also at the same time um, the big problem, as we'll see in a minute. So, so the idea is why don't we use it for Raman imaging? But the problem is, how do we get this hyperspectral information when we've now a whole field of view of a camera, and every pixel contains this 1,000 spectral channels, but how can we get them? There's no camera with 1,000 spectral channels that you can buy or something like that. So we have to find some other way of getting the spectral information out. And this is now what is done here. I, I will try to go very quickly over this. Um, you might have heard about Fourier infrared spectroscopy, which, which is one way uh, where you measure in the infrared absorption properties of materials, and it's done usually with an interferometric way. So if you know how that works, you also understand how this one works. So basically, you take a Michelson interferometer, as shown here, and you modulate the path lengths of one of the two paths, and if you now had some red light from the sample, let's imagine just ideal laser red light or something like this coming to our interferometer, you would, of course, get, depending on the precise optical path lengths, you get constructive, destructive, constructive, destructive interference. So you get this interferogram, if you want. And the trick is, of course, if you now have blue light, you also get constructive, destructive, but they would appear at a different spacing because it's a different wavelength. And that's, that's what you're using. So if you now have something that is red and blue all together, you get some sort of... Um, incoherent overlap of these curves. So it typically looks like this. There's one particular point where the path length difference is equal. So even for white light, you always get constructive interference. And then you're moving out of this path length, and pretty quickly your interference seems to die away. But you can measure this. And it turns out if you do a Fourier transformation of that measurement along the optical path length axis, you can recover the spectrum. Because every spectral line has a sinusoidal component in that overlap. And if you analyze it for sinusoidal component, that's precisely what a Fourier transformation does. You get it back. You get some additional offset component here, but that doesn't hurt you very much. So it's okay. It's called Fourier transform spectroscopy. Yes. Okay, um, so the question is, what, what if it's incoherent light? Um, it turns out it doesn't matter. So um, it maybe has to do sometimes with a misunderstanding of what, what is a photon and how photons interfere. Every photon in my world only interferes with itself. And it doesn't matter. It, you can split a photon if you want. As long as you don't measure it, it goes both ways. It can interfere with itself. So you can determine the spectral properties this way as well for totally incoherent light. Yeah? Of course, you have to adjust everything well and so on, but it's okay. It works. So um, let's look at this a little bit more in detail. So here we have a sketch. We have the, the objective here. We are in the infinite beam path. There's our interferometer. There's the camera. This would be the equivalent of the tube lens where we focus onto the camera again so that a pixel from the object space becomes a pixel on the camera. So that's fine. If we then modulate uh, by moving one of the mirrors, you get your interferogram, you get your spectrum, you're, you're good. Now let's, let's look what happens if, um, well, first of all, we have to be pretty, I uh, know, sorry. What happens to a pixel now that is not here but at some other position? What actually happens in this case, very luckily, is that you still get the perfect interference and it's a different pixel on the camera. So that scheme, if it's adjusted right, works for a whole field of view simultaneously. Of course, yeah, your optical components need to be nice and 
uh, not too big wavefront errors and so on, but it, it's possible to do that. Um, so what you need to make this really work is a couple of technical things. So one thing is you need very precise control of that mirror. We are talking about interferometry, so we need whatever, one-tenth of lambda, so it comes down to a few nanometers that we need to know where this mirror is. How do we do that? Well, we put some reference laser sort of over the corner of the mirror, a photodiode, and then we can move that mirror for many, many, many millimeters even, and we can count fringes, one, two, three, and we know precisely where we are. As long as the laser has always the same wavelength, we are good. Yeah? That is sort of easy to solve. Um, we are using Arduinos for this thing to, to just track where we are. Um, however, there's a big problem. That's this one. Try to buy a motor with the necessary precision that you can move over a millimeter and it doesn't wiggle its axis. Because they always have tolerances for how much, how much steering precision they have. It doesn't exist. If you want that, you have to build it yourself, meaning having like three points on the mirror and always three piezos that move. Eh, don't do that, yeah? It sounds like really a lot of work. So we, we thought we have to come up with some better concept than this type of interferometers. Turns out there was even a commercial machine for those who might have heard about it uh, from a company called Applied Spectral Imaging in Israel. They were making um, an instrument that was called Sky um, Spectral Carrier Typing was the application. And they used a Zanyak interferometer for this, which is great because it's super stable. Um, but it turns out for this application completely unusable because it doesn't support enough optical throughput. You cannot, you cannot fiddle, it's too big basically. You cannot fiddle the beams through it well enough so you would have a tiny field of view and you wouldn't get enough spectral channels in with this machine. We wanted to use that because we happen to have one at our institute but it just doesn't work. It's good for fluorescence but it's not good for Raman imaging. You want much more spectral resolution in. So we built our own and the Let's analyze where, what the problem is. Um, what we did is we came up with using this cat eye reflector trick, so the, um, the corner cube reflection. Because if you know about corner cubes, they, they, they always return beams in exactly the same direction that you send them to it. So they are used commonly when you, uh, when you want to do field measurements of large distances. People don't want to fiddle around with adjusting mirrors to lasers to send them back. So they just put something there cat eye, send the laser, and the laser automatically returns to the measurement machine and you can do all kinds of uh, measurements with that. And so why not use it for this interferometer? Because then the motor can wiggle and we don't care. It does wiggle a little bit, but the beams always return in the same angle, which means that they interfere precisely at the right position on our detector. So here you see the design. If you, if you analyze that a bit more closely, um, for polarization reasons, it turns out that you want to illuminate one particular, one of these uh, six, six parts of such a corner cube reflector. And if you send the light in here, it will be reflected twice and come out here. And we have gained two advantages. One of them is it doesn't matter when one of these mirrors wiggles. And the second thing is um, we have now also the possibilities of using two outputs. So we sort of turned the Michelson into a Marzenda type interferometer because we have entry here and in the second layer we get two outputs and we can send them on two cameras and get two interference signals simultaneously, one constructive, one destructive. That's kind of good, better signal to noise. And robustness against laser fluctuations and so on. Um, so this is how it's built and in the end it actually, um, we analyzed that a bit and it turns out that you can cut pieces off these corner cubes that you can just buy from Edmund Optics or any other company. And this way we could make them really fit closely together and get a huge optical throughput. So we don't have any problem anymore to send the full camera image with all the spectral information through that thing. Um, this is how it looks like in the lab. And this is schematically, so we have a laser, two watts of laser power that we send into our sample in a light sheet configuration. This is a bit on something called OpenSpim, you can download from the web for free, where you can find all the designs of, of how to do the parts and so on. Of course, you, you need the objectives and stuff like this. Um, and then this is sort of the emission light, uh, our Raman emitted light sideways. It goes through this interferometer on the camera, and then we have a motor that moves it this way. What you see here is the reference laser here. 
that we coupled over the same mirrors with a diode then to see where we actually are in our stepping. And then the big laser that illuminates here the, the sample. Right, and then there's a trick. Um, you can sample it in the ordinary way. That would mean per fringe you would need two sampling steps. Then, but the problem is you would have to take maybe 2,000 to 4,000 images for a decent spectrum. And then if you look what you've actually done, you're really interested only in this part of the spectrum. And this is totally empty. Yeah? So you think like, why wasting so many images on something you're not able to measure? So we therefore did an intentional undersampling. We only sample instead of the Nyquist limit, we, we undersampled it by a factor of two, and that leads to intentional aliasing, so what we measure is this way around. But because this part is totally empty, and we can even enforce that by putting the right filters in that make sure there's absolutely nothing there, it's okay. We don't lose anything. We just have to know how to interpret our data in the end. So here you see some examples. This is light sheet illuminated. And what I've overlaid from the spectral information, in every pixel we have now 500 to 1,000 spectral bands, basically, that we measured. And uh, I've overlaid uh, a couple of these bands uh, just to show you that there's some interesting information there. This is just a sample of agarose gel. Um, and inside, there's polystyrene and polymethylmetacrylate beads. And you see that you can nicely spectrally distinguish them So with these pseudo colors. And what is shown in blue is also the fluorescence, uh, not the fluorescence, the Raman scattering of the water, because water also does do Raman scattering. Water is actually a terribly bad Raman scatterer, but that's super good, because then we have a chance to discriminate something in the water. If water was something else, if you tried to embed it in benzene or something like this, you wouldn't be able to see anything, because the medium would overpower the whole rest of the spectra. So here you see, that's the water spectrum here. But this is, of course, what we're interested in in some of these peaks as well. So that's PMMA. Um, this is if we take only the spectrum of a two by two pixel region. It becomes noisy, as you see. Um, there's a few more things that I didn't tell you about. Like you have to do tiny corrections for the pixel position effect. Because if you're going a little bit diagonal, the path length is slightly different than if you go straight, right? Tiny effect, but you have to correct it. Um, and also there's some tricks of how to make spectra that are properly zero-centered. Um, if you just take the absolute, you get not so good results. But if you, if you do the correct phase correction to the spectra, you, you can just take the real part and that gets you better results. Um, here's uh, the polystyrene, also fine. Uh, you can compare the polystyrene to what you can pull out the database from, from the internet. And that's the spectrum in the reference database. And as you see, precisely the same, except for one big difference here. But that's, of course, the water, because they didn't measure it with water. And we have it in water, right? So that makes sense. And turns out that actually our spectral resolution is better than what we get out of the database. So we had narrower line width than what, what you could download from the internet. Um, and here's some biology. So this is a zebrafish eye uh, that was just a bit formalin fixed, but not embedded just in water. And it's illuminated from the sides, and you see one of the big problems of light sheet. If you have scattering tissue, especially the eye of a zebrafish, well, what, what it's made for? It's made for focusing light, right? And it does focus light. Uh, hmm. So looks like we have a trouble here. Yeah? We, need, we could, of course, try to dither the light sheet by, by illuminating several of them from different sides or, or make it go round. But that's a lot of effort. And then we thought about it, and we thought, OK, what is biology? Biology is water, right? Water and water and a little bit of stuff in the water. So why not use our water signal? So if you look at the water signal, that's the blue stuff. The water signal is a very good indication what is the local power density in every part of the sample. So if we divide by the water signal, we should be able to normalize our data to be then fine, right? Turns out it works really well. All the stripes are gone. And you, you get a much clearer. Of course, there's a bit of degradation in the quality here as well. Um, but at least it doesn't look so artifactious anymore. So luckily, biology is really just water. Um, right, then you can 
look at different regions in the sample, get out the spectra, and it all makes sense. This is water. This is the so-called plexiform layer of the eye where there's lots of axons and neurons going through, so it's mostly lipids. And indeed, this is a typical spectrum of lipids. And this uh, eye, um, the center um, of the, the lens is made out of um, proteins mostly, um, I think keratin. And uh, indeed, that corresponds to protein spectra. Sounds good. And one has to say that this looks to you like a fluorescence image, but it is really Raman scattering. And it has the original one has 2,000 by 2,000 um, pixels. Then we bend it down two by two to get a bit sort of better signal to noise. So this is 1,000 by 1,000, roughly. Um, but this is really, really difficult to get with a machine that takes so many milliseconds per point, right? So we, we've gained a lot in speed this way. And uh, that allowed us over one night to measure even a, a whole series of 50 slices of the zebrafish eye. So we have now a 3D Raman image with 1,000 by 1,000 pixels and um, 512 spectral channels, I think. Does it say here? Uh, I'm not sure. At least 512 spectral channels, maybe also 1,000. Um, and then the last thing we, we were thinking about there is can we somehow run this data set with this incredible amount of information? It's also many, many gigabytes. I don't know, 20 gigabytes or something like that. Um, through some algorithm and pull out what is in it because there's chemistry in it. There's these, these different um, spectral components, so there must be some way of getting them. And it turns out that's a very difficult problem. It's, it's called the blind source unmixing problem. And... Um, but there's algorithms for it, and one of them is the non-negative matrix factorization. And that's what we apply to it uh, and basically ask to the computer, find us five components to interpret the data with. And it came up with these components totally uh, unsupervised, if you want. And, and therefore, it's quite, quite interesting and, uh, and nice that it found things that we can actually identify as being proteins, lipid, water, and something that you would call DNA or RNA or something like this which makes sense, yeah, so that's nice. And then we can pseudo color our data set with these components, or three of them, and that's what we've done here. So this is, now the pseudo color looks very similar um, to what you've seen before, but it's pseudo colored from the components that it found with the non-negative matrix factorization unmixing. Okay, so not too bad, quarter of an hour overtime. So in the future, we want to improve on that, and, and even though as nice as it is with the for a year spectroscopy, we will move away from it again. Because if you analyze how much is it really better, we are a lot faster than the commercial instruments, but if you analyze the theoretical limits for some cases, we are only a factor of five faster. And the reason is that the Fourier transform sort of sets us back in signal to noise quite a bit for the case of Poisson noise here. And that's why the next step we are going to try is some concepts that are called integrated field spectrometers, and they are used a lot in astronomy and they work on, on using microlens arrays for, for, for doing our spectra. Okay, so now we really deserve a break, I think. I think so, yeah. So I think we'll have to go straight on to the break. Uh, we, we listened more to Rainer rather than having to uh, have the chance of answering questions. So, uh, so let's uh, thank uh, Rainer for his wonderful talk. Okay, so, so coffee break now. We'll start again as we're supposed to at 11. So.